Okay guys, let's take a look at today's lesson. Uh, we're going to be looking at complex numbers in polar form. So I do want to talk about complex numbers for just a moment. We really don't spend a whole lot of time on complex numbers in high school, uh, although it is a pretty important topic in the higher maths. We just kind of look at, you know, we've looked at complex numbers in Cartesian form, which is this one right here. You know, A plus BI, we should be familiar with that, right? The A part is the real part, the BI part is the imaginary part. And in actuality, the, the overall umbrella for numbers would be complex numbers. That's the overall umbrella. We have real numbers when B is zero, right? So it's kind of a different way to look at things. They really are significant. Uh, they're actually used in, in upper level maths. And in, in, like for example, I have a friend who's an electrical engineer and he said they use complex numbers all the time with circuits and stuff. I mean, I don't, I'm not a, I don't do physics, right? I don't know. I just, mathematics is all my thing. So, but there, it is a thing. I mean, it's, it's important. So I just kind of try to throw imaginary numbers in there every once in a while, just so we can, you know, be used to them, kind of take a look at them. We are going to, today, we're simply going to go from our Cartesian form of a complex number to a uh, polar or trig form of a complex number. That's kind of, we're looking at just a, a different form for a complex number. We can graph them. And so the graph would be on, it looks like an XY coordinate plane. So that's why I really need you to label the axes. You remember when we were graphing in three dimension, when we were looking at the vectors in three dimensions, we, gr we labeled the axes because there's more than one way to graph in three dimensions, right? There's more than one way. So you need to label the axes so people know which way you're using. Well, there's more than one use for this kind of quadrant plane, right? There's more than one use. And we're using it for the x, um, usually the x-axis is the norm, but it's going to be our real number axis. And the y-axis is going to be our imaginary number axis. And so we would just label it with the R, E, and M, I, M to graph uh, points. All right, so let's talk about um, imaginary numbers. Okay, So the modulus, it's a vocab word, the modulus is of this, is this formula right here. Um, absolute value of z is the square root of a squared plus b squared. Okay, that's just a new vocab word. So we would simply take, and this isn't just for polar form. This is for Cartesian form. That's a, that's a thing in imaginary numbers. It's called the modulus and you would find it this way. Square root of a squared plus b squared. That would be, we would just put the coefficients of these in. I had some students um, wanting to put the i in. We don't put the i in. We just put the coefficients in to our formula. Okay. So then our polar form, so this is our, our complex um, form in, you know, rectangular or Cartesian in the Cartesian coordinates, this is what our imaginary number looks like in polar form. We have r plus cosine theta plus i sine theta. That's just what it looks like in polar form. We're just going to be going back and forth between Cartesian and polar form. That's one of the things we'll be doing today with complex numbers. And we have some formulas. So this, notice how these formulas are the same whether we are in, um, you know, well, they, we get the A and the B out of the Cartesian one. So if we, we want to move into this form, we would need to find Z, or basically absolute value of Z, which would be R. And tangent theta is B over A. So those are just how we're going to go from here to here. And I have some examples of that, so we can look at how to do that. So the number R, R is the modulus. So R is this, R equals this. Okay, so this number, this letter right here, R stands for this quantity. Okay. The formulas here, you are not going to have to memorize. We don't really use complex numbers that much, so I don't see a need for you to memorize all the formulas. The formulas that I have you memorize we use often, but these don't, we don't, so I would provide them to you. They're not that hard, but you just aren't going to have to memorize them. Um, what I mean by the formulas, I mean this formula right here. You're not going to have to memorize this formula. 
you would need to know how to find r and theta. You would need to know how to do that, but you're not going to need to know this formula. Okay. So we're also going to multiply and divide complex numbers in polar form. These formulas you don't need to know either, but let's talk about them. So I have one complex number called z sub 1 and z sub 2. These are my complex numbers. Uh, r sub 1, so I have all these, uh, these components of this one are in sub 1, the components of this one are in sub 2. So to multiply them, what I would do is I would take the modulus, the r1 and r2, and I would multiply them. Okay, that seems kind of common sense, right? We'd multiply those. Then I would take these angle measures, 1 and 2, and I would add them. So I think that makes sense. If we're multiplying, usually multiplying and adding go together, right? I mean, why, with logarithms, they go together. So that's kind of a, shouldn't be a hard stretch for us to think multiplying and adding go together. And then we'll get um, our answer for those two being multiplied. Then if we are dividing, we divide the modulus, R1 divided by R2, and we subtract the angle measures. Which again, that kind of makes sense. Dividing goes with subtracting. So if you had to memorize these, it shouldn't be that intense, right? It shouldn't be that bad because they make sense. Okay. Questions about this before we start the examples? All right, let's move to the second slide. Okay, we have kind of three objectives over here. We're going to graph and I didn't put up here to graph just a single, I should probably go back to that slide because we had a little bit of confusion on the daily work. I didn't put on here to, you know, to graph a single point. But I want us to understand that A plus BI is a point. It's one point. If I ask you to graph like 2 plus 3i, let's just do that so that we're, we don't have any confusion. Let's say, we, you're because you are going to be asked to do that, so if I ask you to graph um, 3 plus 2i, let's say, what I would do is I would go to 3 on my real, this is the real portion of the number and this is the imaginary portion. I would go to 3 on the real number line, or the real portion, and then I would go up to 2, and it would just be a point. So this correlates with just that one point. So there are some problems that you're going to be doing where you're going to be graphing individual points. You don't need to try to connect them together or anything. It's not going to make a line. They're just individual points. Okay, versus the graphing we're getting ready to do on the next slide. And let's, exp let's talk about why these aren't just individual points. This is a whole set of complex numbers. It's not just one number. It's a whole set that we're going to graph. And here's the criteria of the set. This is the name of the set. They're just calling it set S. And we're probably not as familiar with set notation maybe as other notations, but that, that's what that is. And it says they want us to graph all A plus BI such that, do you remember that? from, it's such that, all, we want to graph all, so all imaginary numbers such that our A value is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so let's, we would graph it on a, our number line, we're going to label our axes. And so I want all imaginary numbers such that the A part is positive. So. This is the real axis, right? Where would the real, at? we want real numbers, the real portion to be positive, that would be over here, right? So we would basically just shade this area over here. I mean, that would be our graph, okay? On the second problem, this is a, also another set of imaginary numbers. The set name is C, that's the name of it. All z, z is an imaginary number, right? It's the whole imaginary number. All z such that, all z such that the absolute value of z is 1. So absolute value of z is also the modulus, right? Square root of a squared plus b squared, and that needs to be 1. 
Hmm. So let's think about that for a second. So we want all imaginary numbers whose modulus is 1. Okay. That would be this. Mm -hmm. It is. Sure is. Because absolute value z is r, isn't it? It is. It, yeah, absolute value z is r. That's r equals 1. That's good. So what if I wanted to graph all z such that the um, absolute value of z is less than or equal to 1? What would I do? Wouldn't I just shade? Just shade inside the circle? Okay, yeah, we, we're going to get to graphing polar inequalities in a, in a couple of days. But that's what I would do. I would just shade inside the circle. Are we okay with that? All right. So now let's work on transforming back and forth between, so this is Cartesian form of an imaginary number, and we're going to go to polar form, or trig, polar or trig, trigonometric form. Okay, so let's do that first, and then we're going to go backwards. We're going to go from polar form to um, Cartesian form. All right. So in order to go from Cartesian, we need to use our formula for R. R is the square root of A squared plus B squared. So R in our new, new formula is going to be 5. Then we need the angle measure. So tangent theta equals um, 4 over 3. Now that's not a unit circle value, but that's not going to stop us, is it? Right? So we don't need a calculator. We just solve for theta by taking the arc tangent of both sides. So theta is going to be arc tangent of 4 thirds. Now I'm going to write the formula up here for for polar form just so we can look at it as we are plugging into it. Okay, that's our formula. So let's um, write our formula. So it's R, which is 5, times cosine of uh, theta is arc tangent arc tangent of four thirds plus i sine arc tangent of four thirds. Okay. How is that? Now, let's look at, I guess, mathematicians got tired of writing that out. That's the only thing I can figure. Because they came up with a shorthand notation, which I think would be important for you to know, for you to recognize. I want you to look at this notation, and I want you to compare it to this, and see if you can figure out where did they get that from? Where did they get CIS from? Do we see that? It's just cosine I sine, right? And they, I guess, again, they just got tired of writing it out. Let's say we wanted to write it out in shorthand form, which is fine. I don't mind if you write it in shorthand form. You can write it out like this. This is perfectly acceptable. This is the formula. Or you can write it in shorthand form, which would be Z equals. So let's see if we can figure that out. This corresponds to R, right? So 5. CIS, that's cosine I sine and then the angle measure, right? The angle measure is arc tangent four-thirds. And I am perfectly fine if you want to write it like that. Okay? So now we're going to go from polar form to Cartesian form. So let's do that. And I'm going to turn this into the big formula because I really can't work with it very well, you know, shrunk like that. So let's do that. So let's turn this into the formula. So it would be 5 cosine 144 degrees plus I sine 144 degrees. 
Now, in order to go from polar to Cartesian, it's just a matter of, you know, finding the angle measure and multiplying everything out. That's all it is. In fact, this formula up here, look how un it's gigantic, right? <coughs> if you want to try to simplify it, like get a triangle for arc and read you know, for an arc tangent four thirds, and then read sine off of it, and then multiply by five, you're going to get right back there. If you try to simplify it from that form, it's going to go right back to um, just regular Cartesian form. So don't. Don't do it. Just leave the cosine, I sine, the CIS. That's, that's the polar form. So we would just use a, this is a, not a unit circle value, so you would need your calculator. Or we would do some kind of arc something like going on like that. Or I could give you a unit circle value where you wouldn't need your calculator. We could go either way with this kind of problem, whether you, you know, it was unit circle or not. So it's going to be 5 times cosine of 144 degrees is negative 0 0.809 plus 5 times sine of 144 degrees is 0 0.5877. I, so let's clean that up. And so Z would be negative 4.045 plus 2.939I. So this would be our Cartesian form, or rectangular form of that imaginary number. Okay? The last the last part that we're going to work on is multiplying and dividing imaginary numbers in polar form. Okay, so let's do that. I actually need a little room here. Are we okay if I erase some of this? Okay. Erase some of that. Okay. So the formula for multiplying them together, if you recall, we multiply the modulus together. 2 times 5 gives us 10. Right? And then we're going to, what are we going to do with the angle measures for cosine? We're going to add them, right? The multiplying one is when we add them. So it would be cosine of pi over 4 plus pi over 3 plus i sine of pi over 4 plus pi over 3. Okay, it does require for us, us to simplify it. So, 10 cosine, so pi over 4 plus pi over 3 is 7 pi over 12. Okay, so um, that is those two being multiplied together. Could I write it in CIS form? Sure. Yeah, I could if I wanted to. I mean, that would take an extra step, so I'm not going to, but I could. I could write it in CIS form. Could I write it in Cartesian form? Sure. I could write it in Cartesian form. Depends on if you're, if you're not directed or told well, how what form to leave it in. I would just leave it alone like that. You do have to simplify it. Um, but you could put it in Cartesian form. And so, this, because this is exact, I mean, I actually prefer exact form, right? If I'm going to put it in Cartesian form, we're going to have to do decimals. So, we could say it's approximately, and you don't have to do this, I'm just giving you the information, approximately negative 2.588 plus 9.659i, and that would be Cartesian form. and polar form. Okay? The last one is dividing. So let's work on our dividing. Give us a little room over here. So let's think about it. So when we're dividing, what are we going to do with the modulus? We're going to divide them, right? Divide the modulus, the 2 and the 5. So I get 2 fifths times and what are we going to do with the angle measures this time? We're going to subtract them. We're going to subtract them. So I get cosine of pi over 4 minus pi over 3 
plus i sine pi over 4 minus pi over 3. Okay, so, of course, we're going to have to go ahead and subtract them. So pi over 4 minus pi over 3 is negative pi over 12. Now, we really need to simplify this and use our even odd properties, plus it gives us an opportunity to use our even odd properties. So cosine, let's think about our even odd properties, cosine of negative theta is what? Is it negative cosine or just cosine? Which one is it on even odd? It's just cosine. It's a positive cosine. We do need to remember. Okay. And what about sine of a negative angle measure? What's our even odd property for that? Negative sine. Beautiful. Negative sine theta. Okay, so we're going to fix these. So we get two-fifths times cosine pi over 12. Since the sine one is going to generate negative, it's going to be minus I sine pi over 12. So in this form, we can't write it in CIS form because CIS form is plus. So if we wrote it in CIS form, we would need to write it with a negative angle measure. So, Okay, and if we wanted to put it in Cartesian form, um, our answer would be, so this would be approximately 0 0.3864 minus... 0.1035i. So we have Cartesian and polar. How are we? Are we okay? Okay. All right.